I know you guys are really nervous. So, let's start with an icebreaker question, shall we? I want the six of you, raise your hand if you signed up to enlist in a culture war. Raise your hand. No? No? All right, so here's the reason I asked that question, ladies and gentlemen. We have papers, a florist, shirt maker, military man, and a fireman. Everyday people. Everyday people. These are not people that majored in culture war at the seminary. They're not United States senators. These are just everyday people like all of you in this room. And yet they find themselves on the front line in the battle for the soul of this culture, for the very way of life. What kind of people ought we to be? And I think it's important as we begin our conversation with them that all of you in your seats right now there, enjoy your comfort and your air conditioning. That when you leave here, may go home to your farms, your businesses, your churches, and think this could not happen to you. I'd be willing to bet the six people on, up on the stage here tonight all thought the exact same thing as well. That this wouldn't happen to them, and this could not happen here. I want to start with you, uh, Chief Cochran, if I could. Give our audience an idea of what it means to become a fireman. Why would you want to do that? What kind of training, discipline does it take to accomplish that? Well, I was born in poverty in Shreveport, Louisiana in the early 60s, and I was one of six kids. Uh, we were living in a government project. My dad left my mother, and she raised all six of us by herself. Um, we moved to an alley of a shotgun house, and one Sunday after church, we heard a siren outside of our house, and we screamed to our feet and opened the front door, and there was a big red Shreveport Fire Department fire truck in front of our house. Uh, Miss Maddie's house across the alley from us was on fire, and I was smitten on that day that I wanted to be a firefighter when I grew up. And there were three things that I thought about as a little kid. Uh, I wanted to be a firefighter, I didn't want to be poor, and I wanted a family because I realized how awful it was not to have a dad at home. Uh, the grown-ups told us that in America, all of our dreams would come true. If we believe in and have faith in God, if we go to school and get a good education, if we respect grown-ups and treat other children, like we wanted to be treated, then our dreams would come true. So they fed faith and patriotism into us growing up in Shreveport, Louisiana. And in 1981, my childhood dream come, came true. I became a firefighter. With 18 years in the department, I became the fire chief of the Shreveport Fire Department. In 2008, I was appointed fire chief in Atlanta under Mayor Shirley Franklin. After there for 20 months, I was appointed by President Obama to head the United States Fire Administration. And less than one year later, I was recruited back to Atlanta by the Honorable Mayor Kasim Reed and served him until January 6th of this year when I was terminated from employment uh, from the Atlanta Fire Rescue Department. So my childhood dream came true, fairy tale career ended uh, in this year, 2015. So, Chief, you, you are the American dream. I mean, you understand the story, ladies and gentlemen, you just heard. This is the American dream right here. I mean, you are a living embodiment of it. So, if you lost your job, I'll tell you the So, given, given all of the merit badges you've earned all the way through life, right? You clearly must have been derelict in your duty. You must have done something wrong in your job to cause you to be fired, except that wasn't the case. In fact, you were fired for no, no reasons that had anything to do with your job, but for simply writing a book. Tell our audience about that. About three and a half years ago, I was conducting a men's small group Bible study at my church called The Quest for Authentic Manhood. And I asked the men, uh, are men today still suffering from the consequences of what Adam did in the Garden of Eden? And of course, all of them said yes, and I asked them to tell me why. And as they talked, the question God asked Adam in the garden, who told you that you were naked, kept ringing over and over again in my head. So I was so curious, I began to research the word naked to see if God was asking him more than who told you that you don't have on any clothes. And I found out that 
naked meant condemned and deprived. And when I, when I discovered that, I also researched the word clothed uh, and found out that clothed meant uh, redeemed and restored. And so uh, Galatians 3 and 27 says, those who have been baptized in Christ have been clothed with Christ. And God told me the reason why that was such a curiosity to me is that there are too many Christian men, clothed men today, still acting like naked men, and I need to ask them today, who told you that you were naked? And that's what the book is all about. The <laughs> that trouble was the fact that in the book, I dealt with sexual challenges that Christian men have, and spoke of biblical marriage and biblical sexuality, and that's what caused the trouble that led to initially my 30 day suspension without pay and subsequent termination from employment with the city of Atlanta. What you just heard is an amazing story. Nothing wrong with his record at all, to the point that he is appointed to one of the highest posts you can be as a fireman. He's working literally for the President of the United States and for expressing his Christian viewpoint in print in his own private time. His own private time. Let that sink in for a moment. His own private time. He loses everything. Baron Sutton, let me bring you into the conversation next because your story is very well known uh, to our audience. A lot of them listen to my radio show and I have done my best to make your story very well known. And all of your story is very well known to the people in this room. It's just flowers. Aren't you just selling flowers? What, what's, what's the big deal? Why not just sell the flowers? Here? Especially because you sold them to this client so many times. What's, what's different about this time? And I put my hands on his, and I said, well, I'm sorry, I can't do your wedding because of the relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, he said, I understand. And we talked about his mom, we talked about his engagement, we talked about why he decided to get married. Uh, he asked me for recommendations of another florist. I gave him three names of florists that I knew were doing a great job because I really wanted a beautiful wedding. And we hugged each other, and Rob left. When, when I do a wedding, it's, I put everything into it. And I couldn't do blogs because it was just like Christ. It's, it's part of you. It's what you make. It's what you make. It's what you celebrate. And as much as I love raw, I couldn't celebrate his wedding. You've mentioned this customer by his first name, like you had a relationship. That, that you had something beyond just a normal customer business relationship. Is that true? What's your relationship with Rob? Rob had been my customer for over 10 years and uh, we had a, a great working relationship and he would come in and pick out different bases and, and different containers and he'd be real weird and he'd say, uh, this is the event I want to celebrate and do your thing. And that was awesome to me because I got to do something creative and out of the box and something that I knew that I really liked. And uh, it, was, it was a privilege to be able to do that for him. But again, I couldn't do his way. So here we have a story, ladies and gentlemen, where this is a customer she had a personal relationship with. Despite their differences, she was happy to serve him. He asked her the one thing from her that she could not provide. And that is to violate her conscience and disobey Christ in order to serve him in this context. And because of that relationship, the good news is there's no need for Baron L to be here tonight. He went about his way, went to another floor, and said, I respect differences, I believe in tolerance and diversity. So Baron L, thank you very much. That's not actually what happened with the story. Yeah. <laughs> he went right out of there and reported her, like a George Orwell novel. So much for that relationship. Another story here in our panel that I know a lot of you are familiar with, Aaron and Melissa Klein. People are very familiar with what happened to you and 
the court case and the fines. But I want, Melissa, I want you to share with the audience what you told us last night in a reception that we had, just kind of getting everybody a chance to get to know one another and get ready for tonight. And what it was like interacting with fellow believers and the support that you got from the community, or in some cases, the support that you did not get from people. Can you share that with the folks here in the audience tonight? good side of the support that we've gotten um, nationally and even internationally um, has been really great. Um, we've had a lot of, you know, emails of, of saying, you know, we support you, we are praying for you. Um, on the downside, we've also gotten a lot of hate mail. Um, we've gotten threats, we've gotten death threats. Boy, nothing says tolerance like death threats, huh? <laughs> I mean, I just feel that warm fuzzy. You guys feel that emanating here in the room. Um, we get lately, which I don't know why lately, because um, it's been, we're going on three years of going through this, um, we've been getting inappropriate things mailed to our PO box. Um, and uh, that's just really disheartening, you know? It's just... Disheartening is when people say, I support you, but I know you said last night you've had a lot of those conversations to the point that people said, hey, I'm happy to give you my business, but I don't want people to know I'm doing business with you. Tell us about that. Yeah, um, we had, when we had the shop, um, we had lots of people that would come in and be like, you know, we're just so proud of you guys. We're so glad, you know, that you're standing up for your faith. Um, and then they'd want to order stuff, we want to support you. And then I'd go to put, I'd always put my sticker on the box that said Sweet Cakes by Melissa, and it was a black sticker with, you know, pink writing. And, um, they'd ask me to not put that on the box. And so I sat there and I thought, if you're with me, and you're standing with me, why can't you stand yourself? And, um, That, to me, might be the most disappointing thing we're going to hear in this conversation. I have more respect for people who are just openly opposed and honest about it. That we're with you, but we don't want to go public. We don't want to say anything. About a week ago, I interviewed Craig James, the former sportscaster, who lost his job with Fox Sports because of what he said, actually, ironically, in a deba debate with Senator Cruz. And all he did, now this is a gentleman that worked for 20 years doing college football broadcasting all over the country for major networks and hundreds of people in crews that knew him, traveled with him. And because of what he said in the political debate, somehow that disqualified him from being in sports broadcasting. And I, I asked him, I said, Craig, all the people you've worked with at all these networks nationwide, no one has stood up and said, hey, I know Craig James. He's not a hater. He's not a bigot. Maybe we disagree, but I've been on the road with him. I've spent time with him. I've seen him interact with his family. This is wrong. And he said to me, a lot of people have done this privately in Melissa A lot of people have sent me private notes, but they're all afraid that if they speak up publicly, they will lose their jobs. At some point, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have to make a decision. Whom do we fear more? The one that can take the jobs away or destroy the body, or the one who can destroy the body and cast the soul into hell? Who do we fear? read and seen numerous interviews with you. I mean, you're kind of like ringing on me. It's not like Donkey Kong, right? So, you know, my wife tells me whenever I face a lot of scrutiny from the same polite and tolerant people that you're dealing with, that it's always harder on her watching it go happen to me than it is when it happens to me. I just sort of view it as a cost of doing business in a way. But in your case, watching this happen and watching your wife and probably her life's dream, this business, watching this happen to her, how did it impact you? It's, it's a, something you never want to see now. I mean, honestly, to, to watch not only something that she worked so hard on, but something we went into together to, to build this business up, watch it be taken away by the very government that was intended to protect your freedom. 
watching it, watching it be destroyed by people who have no tolerance whatsoever. Um, it might surprise a lot of you to hear that I was never in a court. I have yet to be in a court. This was a bureaucratic um, entity that was built from the ground up to do the very thing that was happening to us. It is something that does not recognize the Constitution. It is something that uh, dictates a lot of the government as it sits right now. We're, we're fighting for our religious freedom in, in, in a room filled with bureaucrats that don't recognize our constitutional freedoms. From the beginning, biases are the norm, and that's what we're fighting. And it's an uphill battle, and we need to all take a stand. You're the person on this panel who has won. You have fought for your freedoms and you have won uh, pending an appeal. I want to make sure I get this quote correct. The judge in your case said, quote, to print shirts was based upon the message of the GSLO and not on the sexual orientation of its representatives or members, unquote. Tell our audience what exactly that means and why that was instrumental in your victory. print for anybody. And that was our main, main message. It didn't matter what their belief system was or who they were. That it was really the message. And if someone presents a message to me that conflicts with my beliefs, which you know, contradicts with the Word of God, then for me it's just, that's the line. It's just something that I can't print. And the judge, I think he got it right because he looked at the history of our company and we have rejected messages from different groups uh, across the board that conflicted with my faith. Not just one specific group. We also had shown that we had worked with homosexuals and we would continue to work with homosexuals. So the message was clear to the judge. He could see that it was about the message. It wasn't about who came in our door. And, and that's, that was the point all along is, is hey, I'll work with anybody, but not every message that's asked to me to prove. Folks, I hope you understand what Blaine just said because he just really unlocked the Rosetta Stone to winning this argument. Because I know a lot of you are sitting in your seats and you're concerned, well, I don't want to discriminate against anybody. This isn't about discrimination. This is about whether someone, anyone, regardless of what they may be doing in their private lives or whether they go to church or not, can walk into your place of business or in your home, your private property, your intellectual property, and demand that you do things with it that violates your conscience. Can they demand that you perform a service for them? Let me put it in another context. Would we tell, for example, someone who was gay that owned a t-shirt? company, would we tell them that they had to print really just hateful screeds from Westboro Baptist Church? We have to, you have to do that. Would we tell them to do that? Would that be right? Would anybody in this room side with the idea that that is right? No? Even though we may disagree with the beliefs and the lifestyle of the gay t-shirt owner, every one of us in this room would side with them because we believe in freedom and liberty. Amen? So, would we tell would we tell a black man who owns a catering business that he's got to provide the food and drink for a white supremacist conference? Would he not be able to deny service to them if it violated his conscience? Would he not? Is there anything the government or could force us to do, any service that could force us to perform at all, that we could possibly never say no to? You know what's ironic about that is when there was a crowdfunding campaign for Aaron and Melissa Klein, your crowdfunding campaign was canceled because it violated the terms of service of the organization that hosted the campaign. Is that not ironic? Let me bring in Sergeant Monk as we conclude our conversation here this evening. Because you have a unique calling in this conversation, Philip, in that you took an oath. You are willing to lay down your life for the people that disagree with you, for people whose values you may not share. You are willing to do that as a soldier. Can you tell our audience what your story is and how that impacts and lets them know what's really going on with religious freedom in the military, which I think it's tragic enough what is happening to the average everyday people that are sitting up here. But now, Philip, we're going to tell those of you in uniform that you're not allowed to have the very freedoms that you're willing to lay down your life for. There's something even extra wrong about that. That's right. And I will say right from the start, you call me today and I will drop everything, and I will go anywhere this country needs me, and I will put my life down for you, whether you're gay, straight, young, or old. We will do that.
you cannot speak biblical truth about marriage. Mm -hmm. I come back from a deployment to an open lesbian commander. She wants me and backs me into a corner, <coughs> wants to know my views on marriage. And I'll tell you this, I'm backed into a corner between a major or my maker. I know where I'm going. Yeah. If it's between a commander or my creator, I know where I'm going. deployed to Iraq, there were 600 traumas, 600 of our men and women that were fighting for their lives over there. And every one of them is over there thinking that they are preserving the freedoms right here in America. And probably the most heartbreaking conversation I had with one of those guys that returned was that he felt like in the 10 years, the 10 plus years we've been fighting overseas, the real war for America was happening right here. We got just a couple of minutes left, and I'll go around rapid fire, take 20, 30 seconds. Final word of encouragement and or challenge to the people that are in the audience or watching this around the country. Melissa, I'll start with you. I'll let you go first, get it over with. tell you that before all of this happened, I had a, a very large lack of trust in my God. And I hate to admit that, but I did. And through this, and through standing for Him, I've learned to trust Him so much. And I've seen... more than I've ever seen him in my life. So, you know, I can just, I would just encourage you all, just, you know, stand for God and be strong because you will see him move in your life like you have never seen him move before. Yeah. Yeah. I would challenge you to stand for the next generation. There's nothing more disheartening than to hear your daughter tell a reporter that she feels like a part of her childhood has been stolen because of what has taken place in the state of Oregon. She used to go and have fun working at the bakery with her parents. She doesn't get to do that anymore. And she's saddened by it, she's hurt by it. We gotta stand up for religious freedom in this country. We have to protect it for the next generation. Ronald Reagan said we're, just, we're never a, a, more than a generation away from losing freedom. And that is never more true than right now. I learned three lessons from going through what I'm going through, and I believe all of us as believers should take note. Uh, God always prepares his children for suffering. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two, there are worldly consequences for standing for Christ and for standing for biblical truth. That's lesson number two. Lesson number three is there are also kingdom consequences for standing for Christ and standing for biblical truth. And the kingdom consequences are always greater than the worldly consequences. to choose between living out their faith and keeping their job. But if you're ever faced with the choice of living out your faith or keeping your job, living out your faith is always the right choice. Thank you. If you're a service 
man or woman out there serving, and you face something like this, I tell you what, you've got a threefold avenue or way of going about it. The very first thing I would tell you is drop to your knees and pray to the great I am. That he will see you through. Two, call in reinforcements. You get on that phone, you dial Liberty Institute, and they're, they're experts in this field. They're military experts. We'll, we'll join up with you. And then I will tell you, get off your knees and stand up and fight. Because when you fight back, you win. Let me get the last word. Yeah, I think I'm going to speak directly to the youth, to the kids that are in this room. I want you guys to really listen to the stories that have been told tonight. Because, you know, you guys are the next generation. And the reality that hits home to me is that there's a cost. Just like I mentioned in that video about my kids, they're wrestling with this idea that if I sign up to follow Christ, there's a genuine cost in serving Him. And number two, don't ever substitute love for truth. They have to go together. Love and truth go together. So speak truth and love. And don't give up on it. Thank you so much.